Fertility Q&A. Hi friends, welcome to this week's Friday Fertility Q&A. I am Dr. Natalie Crawford, board certified OBGYN and REI, and today I'm talking and answering all of your fertility questions. First of all, if you like this channel, you like learning more about your fertility, your health, and your body, please subscribe. That helps us spread our mission of fertility awareness and empowerment to more people. So we would really appreciate that. Secondarily, if you want to ask your own question, feel free to leave a comment on this video, or you can go to the community tab and we pull questions from there. All right, so let's dive in. What does an oral medicated intercourse cycle look like from start to finish? Injectables. When is it helpful to try medicated intercourse cycle and for how long until moving on to more invasive options? The first thing to realize is either of these cycles, when you're using medication to make you ovulate and you're doing timed intercourse, this cycle is only helpful if there's a problem with ovulation. It's meaning if you already have regular predictable periods, no issues in your luteal phase and you're ovulating, this cycle is not gonna be helpful for you. So this shouldn't be an option. But if you have slightly irregular periods, if you have really irregular periods, then sometimes using medication can be an advantage. Now, the reason that you're not ovulating is important to know. Is there high prolactin, thyroid abnormalities, PCOS, hypothalamic amenorrhea? So number one, make sure you have an evaluation done before you just start medication. However, once you know the cause, this will help guide medication treatment. So thyroid and prolactin need to be treated first. FHA may actually not respond to oral medication because the problem's at the brain. That stands for functional hypothalamic amenorrhea and the problem's at the brain. So the brain doesn't send out enough hormones. So you're going to need to replace the brain hormones. And so injectable hormones are typically the only option for ovulation injection with FHA, but they carry a lot of risk. They're more expensive, cancellation rate is higher, and the risk of twins and triplets and more is much greater. So sometimes clinics don't do that option and they just would recommend IVF in those circumstances. Oral medications like Clomid or Letrozole is what's most commonly used for ovulation induction. And these are pills that you take for five days. So when you do these, what you're going to do is usually get a period and come in while you're on your period for the baseline. From the baseline, you're then going to take your pills and usually come in about a week later for an ultrasound. That's called monitoring, and we wanna make sure you have an appropriate response. Once we get to a mature follicle size, you're then going to use a trigger shot or monitor your cycles with an ovulation predictor kit. Depends on what your clinic prefers. And then you will be told when to have intercourse, and then sometimes progesterone is given in the luteal phase. I'm a fan of giving progesterone. I've also worked with other doctors who aren't. It doesn't really matter if you're treating the source and getting a better follicle. It should make better progesterone also. So typically, this should follow like a normal monthly pattern. It may shift your ovulation day if you've been tracking it in the past, and that's okay. These medications are working to try to get a better ovulation. So again, ovulation injection, oral or injectable medication is used for an ovulation issue. You can pair it with timed intercourse most of the time. So if the tubes are open and the sperm counts fine, that's appropriate. If the sperm has a mild abnormality, you might want to pair it with an IUI or an intrauterine insemination from the beginning. The other option to use oral medications plus an IUI is in somebody who's already ovulatory who has unexplained infertility. I do have a whole video on unexplained infertility because it's a very different topic and you'll want to learn more about that. Is it normal to have brown spotting in the luteal phase? I get spotting on and off for about a week before my period. Spotting for like a day or two could be very normal. The shedding of the lining, which is what is your period, isn't always a perfectly organized event, but having spotting for about a week is not normal. So to me, this is on the spectrum of an ovulation disorder. If you're not ovulating a good enough follicle, maybe it can't make enough progesterone, and therefore this can be a sign of a luteal phase deficiency. This is a clinical sign. So either a shortened luteal phase or spotting in the luteal phase. I usually recommend making sure you don't have thyroid or prolactin abnormalities, but sometimes we can treat this either with ovulation induction medications, like I mentioned before, Clomid is a great option for this, or with luteal progesterone. But certainly a workup's evaluated to make sure it's not hormonal, or it could be structural like a uterine polyp. So take home message, spotting for a week is not normal, and you do want to get that evaluated. 
Hello, thank you for the answers. I'm in my second round of my Clomid with no luck. Can you please tell me how long it usually takes with Clomid and is there any alternative I can do? Thanks again. So remember Clomid is a medication to induce ovulation. It binds to estrogen receptors in the brain and tricks them into thinking that there is no estrogen available. Therefore, the brain sends out a stronger signal of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which works to stimulate a follicle to grow and then you get a better ovulation. So Clomid is typically used in somebody to help them ovulate, presuming they don't ovulate perfectly. Clomid is also used for unexplained infertility and that's different. But let's say you're using it for ovulation induction, you're never going to have over your age-related chance of getting pregnant. So it does not improve your fertility over baseline. It is only trying to get you from lower up to baseline. The only thing that gets you higher than your natural chance of fertility for your age is IVF, in vitro fertilization. Everything else is trying to take somebody who is subfertile has less of a chance and getting you to your age-related chance at best. So this depends on your age. So the answer to this question is gonna be very different if you're 30 or if you're 40 or if you're 23 or if you're 38. So it's hard to say, but at best, it's gonna be no greater than 20 to 25% per month that you're using Clomid. And those numbers are if you're 30 and younger. So that would be the very best. So it's not surprising that after two months it hasn't worked. Most of us, if you're using Clomid for ovulation injection, say you should try that for about four to six months. And then if you've not had a pregnancy, you should seek further treatment because ovulation is not the only thing holding you back. My endo has caused a distal tubal blockage on one side and a cyst on the ovary on the other. So I have surgery, recovery, and who knows what from there. My question, since there's little to no chance we will conceive before then, should I stop taking prenatals? I know one is not meant to be on them for an extended time. How does that with those struggling for fertility? Actually, you can be on prenatals indefinitely. So absolutely do not stop your prenatal. Keep taking it. A lot of these vitamins and supplements need to build up in your body for an extended period of time. So do not stop the prenatal, keep taking it. As to the first, endometriosis can be really hard. I do have a video on endometriosis you may wanna watch to learn more to help you structure and think about what you want to do next. So endo sucks, you got this, you'll get through the surgery, but just keep taking your prenatal, that's gonna be helpful for you. Thank you so much for such informative video. My question, I've done multiple strengths of Clomid with no ovulation. Would Famara be a good option to try before moving to IUI, PCOS? This is a really good question. So back to those ovulation injection, PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome, and PCOS can cause problems with ovulation and irregular periods. It's one of the top issues with ovulation. Femara or letrozole is actually the drug of choice. We've seen higher live birth rates with Femara or letrozole over Clomid. So if you've maxed out on Clomid, I definitely would try Femara. It works differently before you have to move on to other options. Now, you can't just move on to an IUI because you have to ovulate for an IUI. So if you're not ovulating on Clomid or Femara, there's no IUI. You have to move on to IVF because we can give you high strength injectable hormones like FSH and get lots of follicles to grow for once. IVF works really well for patients with PCOS, but in order to do an IUI, you have to have a medication that can safely get you to ovulate. All right, and does it ever make sense to go straight to IVF before trying other treatments? For example, if the male semen analysis came back with a very low morphology score and the strict Kruger and the female's AMH came back low and everything else for the partners is normal. It often makes sense to go to IVF. Sometimes I think people think of IVF as this last resort option or that they have to jump through all these hoops before they get there. And occasionally insurance does make you jump through those hoops. But for many people, IVF is going to have a higher chance than your natural pregnancy rate. It is going to help you get there faster with multiple medical problems and can help fulfill your goals. So anytime you have a low AMH, you are going to only have a harder time the longer you wait to do IVF. And if you wanna have more than one child, that family planning component of doing IVF sooner may be a huge advantage. As for male factor, there's no denying that when you have an abnormal morphology, that's the shape, structure equals function, IVF is always better for male factor. So if you wanted to skip IUI, which generally is not gonna give you more than a 10% chance of success per month, meaning nine out of 10 people are not going to be pregnant in that scenario, and go to IVF, which is gonna have much greater chance of success, I would totally recommend and support that. And I think that's a good question you should ask your doctor. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this week's 
Fertility Friday Q&A. A few reminders, you can always learn more on the As A Woman podcast, and I do have the Enhance Your Natural Fertility course if you're looking to do a deep dive into your body, your lifestyle, and how that impacts your fertility. You can submit your questions below this video or on the community tab, and we'll be answering some of your questions every week. Thanks, friends. <music>